When he woke up, he saw that Abbot Hans had left his bed and was sitting by the fire talking with Robber Mother. Abbot Hans was telling Robber Mother all about the Christmas preparations he had seen on his journey, reminding her of Christmas feasts and games which she must have known in her youth when she lived at peace with mankind. I'm sorry for your children that they will never experience it. At first, Robber Mother answered in short, gruff sentences, but then she became more subdued and listened more intently. Suddenly, Robber Father turned toward Abbot Hans and shook his clenched fist in his face. You miserable monk! Did you come here to coax me from my wife and children? Don't you know that I am an outlaw and may not leave the forest? Abbot Hans looked him fearlessly in the eyes. It is my purpose to get a letter of ransom for you from Archbishop Absalom. <laughs> oh, ho, 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 I know, oh, I know too well the kind of mercy a forest robber could expect from Absalom. If I were ever to get such a letter, I'd promise you I'd never again steal so much as a goose. The lay brother got annoyed with the robber folk for daring to laugh at Abbot Hans, but at the same time he noticed how Abbot Hans was sitting more peacefully and meek with this wild robber folk than he had ever seen him with the monks at Uvid. Suddenly, Mother Robber rose. Oh, you sit here and talk, Abbot Hans, and we're forgetting to look at the forest. I can hear the Christmas bells ringing. And then they all sprang up and rushed out. It was still dark and bleak winter. And Abbot Hans thought to himself, how can this bell ringing ever awaken this dead forest? After a few moments, a sudden illumination penetrated the forest. And the next moment, it was dark again. And then the light came back. On oh, this time, it pushed its way forward between the stark trees like a shimmering mist. The snow vanished as if someone had removed a carpet and it began to take a green covering. Then the ferns shot up, the heather grew, and spring blossoms shot up with swelling buds. Abbot Hans's heart beat fast as he marked the first signs of the forest awakening. Old man that I am, shall I behold a miracle? Another wave of light, and the leaves of the trees burst into bloom, as if a swarm of green butterflies came flying and clustered on the branches. Trees and plants awoke, and birds hopped from branch to branch. Flocks of paradise starlings with feathers glittering like jewels. Woodpeckers hammered on the tree trunks. And then again, all was dark for an instant. And then a new wave of light, and with it a fresh, warm south wind scattering all the little seeds that had been brought here from southern lands by birds and ships, which could not thrive here normally because of the country's cruel cold. These took root and sprang up the instant they touched the ground. Blueberries ripened, wild geese shrieked in the air, bullfinches built nests, baby squirrels began playing on the branches. Everything, everything, everything came so fast that Abbot Hans could hardly grasp the immeasurably greatness of the miracle that was taking place. Then the next light wave, and with it the scent of newly ploughed acres, and the tinkle of sheep's bells, the juniper berries changing colours every second, the forest flowers covered the ground till it was red, blue and yellow. Abbot Hans bent down and picked a wild strawberry blossom and as he got up, the berry had ripened in his hand. A mother fox came up to rob a mother and scratched at her skirt and rob a mother bent down and praised her young. The cuckoo crowed. Rob a mother's youngsters let out shrieks of pure delight, stuffed themselves with wild strawberries, played with the hares, the crows and rob a father who was standing on a marsh eating raspberries suddenly had a big black bear that stood beside him. Keep to your own ground, you, he said. This is my turf. And the huge bear lumbered off in another direction. New ways of light kept coming. Butterflies so big they looked like flying lilies. Beehives full of honey dripping down on tree trunks. Roses, blackberry vines. Oh, Abbot Hans could not choose which flower to pick for Bishop Absalom. Each flower that appeared was more beautiful than the others. Wave upon wave kept coming, all the life and beauty and joy of summer smiling upon him. 
he could hardly imagine what the next wave of light would bring. And then, an almost celestial atmosphere. The glories of heaven were approaching. Then all grew momentarily still. The glory, now nearing, was such that the heart wanted to stop beating. The eyes wept without one's knowing it. The soul longed to soar away into eternal. From far in the distance, faint harp tones were heard, and celestial song like a soft murmur. Abbot Hans clasped his hands and dropped to his knees. Never had he dreamed he should be granted to taste the joys of heaven in this life, to hear angels singing Christmas carols. The lay brother had darker thoughts. This cannot be a true miracle, he thought, since it is revealed to robber folk. This does not come from God, but has its origin in witchcraft and is sent hither by Satan. It is the evil one's power that is tempting us and compelling us to see that which has no real existence. All the while, birds had been circling around the head of Abbot Hans, and they let him take them in his hands. But all animals were afraid of the lay brother. No bird perched on his shoulder. No snake played at his feet. Then came a little forest dove, and noticing that the angels were nearing, she plucked up courage and flew down on the lay brother's shoulder and laid her head against his cheek. The lay brother felt as if sorcery would come right upon him to tempt him and corrupt him. So he struck out his hand at the dove and cried in such a loud voice that it rang throughout the forest. Go back to hell whence you art come. The angels were so near to Abbot Hans that he could almost feel their feathery touch of their great wings. But when the lay brothers' words sounded, their song was hushed and they retired in flight. The light and the mild warmth vanished in unspeakable terror. Darkness sank over the earth. Frost came. All the growths shriveled up, the animals and birds hastened away, the leaves dropped from the trees, rustling like rain. Abbot Hans felt his heart contracting with insufferable agony. I can never outlive this, that the angels from the heaven had been so close to me and were driven away, that they wanted to sing Christmas carols for me and were driven to flight. Then he remembered the flower he had promised Bishop Absalon and started fumbling among the leaves and moss to try to find a blossom. But the ground under his fingers froze. His heart was full of anguish, so much that he could not rise and fell to the ground and lay there. When the robber folk and the lay brother found him, he was dead. The lay brother began to weep and lamented, for he understood that it was he who had killed Abbot Hans, because he had dashed him from his cup of happiness, that which he had been thirsting to drain to its last drop. When they carried Abbot Hans down to Ovid, they discovered in his right hand something which he must have grasped at the moment of death, a pair of white root bulbs. The lay brother took the bulbs and planted them in Abbot Hans's herb garden, he guarded them for a whole year without them ever flowering, almost giving up on caring for them. But then, on Christmas Eve, when he was so strongly reminded of Abbot Hans, he wandered into the garden to think of him. And look, look, from the bulbs flourished green stalks which bore beautiful flowers with silver-white leaves. He understood that this flower had, in truth, been plucked by Abbot Hans from the Christmas garden in Goinga Forest. The lay brother took a few blossoms and brought them to Archbishop Absalon. When the bishop took the flowers, which had sprung from the earth in the darkest winter, he turned as pale as if he had met a ghost. He sat in silence for a moment, and thereupon said, Abbot Hans has faithfully kept his word, and I shall keep mine. 
So he ordered a letter of ransom to be sent to the wild robber who was outlawed and had been forced to live in the forest ever since his youth. The lay brother departed at once to bring the letter to the robber's cave, and when robber father saw him, he yelled, Oh, I'll hack you monks to bits! It must be your fault that Goring Forest did not last night dress itself in Christmas bloom! The fault is mine alone, said the lay brother, and I will gladly die for it. But first I must deliver a message from Abbot Hans. And he drew out the bishop's letter and told the man that he was free. From now onwards, you and your children shall play and have Christmas among people, just as Bishop Abbot wished you to have it, said he. Robber father stood pale and speechless. It was Robber mother who spoke. Abbot Hans has indeed kept his word, and Robber father will keep his. When the robber and his wife left the cave, the lay brother moved in and lived all alone in the forest, in constant meditation and prayer that his hard-heartedness might be forgiven him. But Gooing a Forest never again celebrated the hour of our Saviour's birth, and out of all of its glory, the only plant which still lives today was the plant that Abbot Hans had plucked. It has been named the Christmas Rose, and each year at Christmas tide, she sends forth from the earth her green stalks and white blossoms, as if she never could forget that she had once grown in the great Christmas garden. <laughs>